You know, as someone who's probably played more Souls likes than any other person on the planet, talking about them is tricky and often unfair to the developers. More than any other genre of game, Souls likes invite a lot of comparison. It's in the name after all, Souls like. And those comparisons usually aren't the most favorable or fair because they're put up against From Software and the Soulsborne games. Even if there isn't a direct comparison being made, a lot of people will compare them, at the very least, on a subconscious level. I think most people would consider FromSoft's games to be the pinnacle of the genre, the gold standard, and as such, it's usually not possible to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against them. Like, you can make a great Souls like, but at the end of the day, you're probably not really competing with Bloodborne or Elden Ring. They're in a different weight class, and that's okay. Then we got Lies of P. This game is very good. In fact, it's so good and so polished and so thoughtfully made that you can compare it directly to FromSoft and it still comes out looking pretty alright. In terms of quality, Lies of P is now up there in my personal rankings of Souls Likes where only a few games make it, like actual FromSoft games and Neo 2, for example. If you want a Souls Like experience that's close to FromSoft, but not literally FromSoft, this is the closest I've seen a game get. I realize that's extremely high praise, but I love the 30 hours it took me to beat the game, and I think the footage mostly speaks for itself. The Korean-based developers at NeoWiz really, really did their homework of studying FromSoft when creating Lies of P. There's a secret sauce to these games in terms of design and presentation, and if even one thing is off, it can dramatically drag down the experience. Yet, despite that, NeoWiz pulled it off and fucking crushed it. I'm a little surprised by the overall response from critics though. They're generally positive, but I think they're still selling it short as just another decent Souls Lake as opposed to the excellent game I believe it to be. We simply don't see Souls Lakes on this level from companies other than FromSoft, and if you're a fan of the genre, this is one of the rare must plays. There is a caveat though, this game can get incredibly difficult and has questionable difficulty spikes. Like straight up, I think this game might be too hard for some people, even if they played other FromSoft games. And I want to make this warning crystal clear so as not to mislead people into buying a game that will make them miserable. I totally understand people who might quit this game less than halfway through. I really do. You do kind of have to get good, as the kids say, and be willing to fail a lot. And stuff like range builds or online co-op aren't options to make things easier against bosses that demand you learn every single attack. You need to meet this game on its own terms without expecting it to be just another Souls like or making the wrong assumptions about what playstyle the game wants from you. In that sense, this game won't be for everyone, but if you're patient and willing to learn, I think you're going to have a good time. After lots of struggling, this game did eventually click for me, and the result is the praise you're seeing me give it now. But I understand how someone who never fully clicked with the combat system would probably disagree with me. I'll go more into that topic later though. For now, let's break Lies of P down piece by piece so I can give a clear picture of what this game is, why it's unique, and how it succeeds while also addressing some critiques and giving tips along the way. The elevator pitch for Lies of P is Bloodborne meets Sekiro meets Twinkified Pinocchio in a game with FromSoft levels of production value and polish. You play as Pinocchio himself, a puppet who has been granted life shortly after the outbreak of the Puppet Frenzy, an event that caused almost all puppets to go crazy with bloodlust as they tear apart the city of Krat, a setting inspired by the Bellapoke era of the late 19th century. On top of that, puppets aren't the only issue as zombies are also running around. Pinocchio has his work cut out for him. As ridiculous as this premise sounds, there's actually a tremendous amount of respect for the source material of the original Pinocchio story by author Carlo Collodi from 1883. Like, basically every character and plot point is referenced in one way or another. For example, you got the cricket sidekick of Gemini inside your lantern, and of course you have characters like Geppetto. The fun part is that there's a twist or fun adaptation to every idea from the original story. The biggest example would be Pinocchio and lying. In the original story, lying is bad, Pinocchio's nose grows, and he has to be truthful to become a quote-unquote real boy. In Lies of P, this concept is flipped on its head to explore the idea of humanity within puppets. Maybe lying isn't so bad. After all, lying is one of the most human things a person can do. Maybe the path to being a real boy isn't telling the truth. There's a lot more to this, but the way everything is woven together is genuinely incredibly well done and entertaining. I didn't expect to care about the characters or story nearly as much as I did, and I even found myself reading all of the scraps of paper I picked up that had world-building lore on them. It was fun unraveling mysteries and learning about the side characters. In general though, it's a more direct form of storytelling than your typical FromSoft game. And while I've seen some people critique that, I think it suits the story they're trying to tell very well. Now as much as I'd love to go into a literary analysis of the themes this game explores, I know that's not why you're here. So let's talk about the game itself and get into the gameplay. If you've played even a single Soulsborne game, the key word I'd use to describe Lies of P is familiar. This game is remarkably similar to what FromSoft makes. You got an Estus flask, bonfires, corpse runs, stamina based combat, a dodge button, challenging bosses that revolve around well telegraphed attacks, a level up lady, a fucking poison swamp level, and much, much more. The level design, enemy layouts, and just overall game feel and pace of combat are eerily similar to an actual FromSoft game to a degree that I haven't 
haven't seen before. It can be a little uncanny, and I had to remind myself that I wasn't playing something FromSoft themselves had made. This is a double-edged sword because it all works incredibly well, but there's also an argument to be made between where the line gets drawn between inspiration and straight copying. I expect some of the pushback or mixed feelings about this game to stem from this idea right here. This is a concept I think about a lot. It's a question I'm faced with every time I play any Souls-like, so here's where I land on it. Basically, imitation and similarity on some level is simply inherent to the genre itself of Souls-likes, and it's up to the developer to put their own twist on the source material to get people interested. I've played my fair share of Souls-likes where I don't think they do enough to separate themselves from the pack, so believe me when I say that despite all the similarities, I think Liza P does more than enough to carve out an identity of its own and justify its existence in a big way. Yes, some of the similarities are uncanny, but as a whole package, Liza P is very much its own thing and was clearly made with an enormous amount of care and passion. Despite the obvious of the story and setting being unique, there's a number of mechanics that make this game stand out too. As a baseline though, Bloodborne meets Sekiro really is the best description. First, when attacking big enemies and bosses, you slowly build up a stagger meter that leads into a critical attack, but you can also perfect parry to build up that meter even more while avoiding damage. Sekiro is the obvious inspiration here as it's kind of close to how it works there. However, this game really makes you earn that stagger because once you've parried and hit them enough, their health bar becomes outlined in white for only a small window of time, and you need to land a fully charged heavy attack to actually trigger the stagger. This is tough since your charged heavy attack is slow, the window you have is only a few seconds, and the enemy might not give you a clear opening. But it's a nice challenge and dynamic that's pretty unique and feels impactful and satisfying when you finally do land that big hit. In addition to parrying and dodging, blocking is an option, but again, Liza P has a new take on the concept. In addition to costing stamina, you also lose a bit of health, but it's recoverable health. If you attack shortly after blocking, you can get that health back. You can also get some of this health back by landing a perfect parry during the same time frame. This too is tricky since if you take any damage while not blocking during this window, the health is no longer recoverable via attacking. I've seen several reviewers say it's just like Bloodborne, but here you have to be far more deliberate with your blocking and subsequent health recovery as opposed to just going feral and attacking like you would after getting hit in Bloodborne. If you're careful with your blocks and don't block more than one or two hits at a time, you can easily get into a habit of recovering all or most of your health. There's also big red attacks called fury attacks that must be parried and cause a fair bit of stagger buildup on the enemy if you successfully land it. Normal blocking isn't an option, and dodging, which in all other circumstances gives iframes, doesn't give iframes for these attacks. However, you can still avoid a lot of these moves if you get out of the way by running back or to the side, so that's good to keep in mind as another option. This is a demanding game, and I found myself pushed into utilizing each of my defensive options to succeed. I will say though that perfect parrying and guarding is pretty central to the experience, so don't make the mistake of playing it like Dark Souls or Bloodborne with too much dodging. But also don't swing too hard the other way and never dodge. Basically, just remember that despite all the comparisons I'm making, Lies of P is ultimately its own thing, and you need to approach it as its own thing as opposed to Bloodborne 2 or Sekiro 2. Even so, once you figure out what this game wants from you, it's fucking hard. There is some really precise timing required on parries, and it feels far less forgiving than Sekiro with a tighter window for success. When you combine that with bosses that move erratically and like to delay their attacks with huge wind-ups and mix-ups, this is a game you're going to die a lot in. Despite my enjoyment, I think there is certainly an argument to be made for the parry window to be extended just a hair, especially when some red attacks are disproportionately punishing for how quickly they can come out. And relying on reaction speed will not be enough for some of these attacks. You really need to internalize the timing required for parries as opposed to using purely visual cues. Back on the topic of mechanics in this game, every weapon has two fable arts, which are basically just weapon arts, but you can activate them after building up enough blue fable bars after landing enough hits. This is a slow process, and to balance this, fable arts are usually very impactful. And that brings us to one of the coolest mechanics of the game, weapon assembly. With the exception of special boss weapons, every weapon in the game can be split in half between its blade and handle, and that means you can mix and match any blade with any handle. This enables some impressive variety in player expression. Let's go over how it works. The moveset and weapon scaling of any weapon is determined by the handle, but the damage and speed of the weapon is influenced by the blade. So for example, you could stick a giant hammerhead on a dagger handle to hit harder, and it'll have the exact same dagger moveset, but it's going to be slower. Also, each blade and handle has different fable arts, so those are also getting mixed up into interesting combos during the assembly process as well. Additionally, when upgrading a weapon with upgrade materials, you only upgrade the blade. Here's a really cool consequence of this system that I think some people might overlook, and I'll illustrate it with an example that happened early on in my first playthrough. I opened a chest and found this cool booster glaive weapon. I equipped it to see it had this sick charge attack that boosts you forward, and I was tempted to use it, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to invest in the upgrade materials to do so. This is a common scenario in Souls games, right? You find something new, but you've already invested materials into your current weapon. Well guess what? Here, I just took the weapon head I was already using and stuck it on the booster glaive, and boom, I got to use this new weapon without needing to invest materials just to test it out. 
This is kind of huge and lends itself to way more experimentation and variety than most games in the genre. Now, all that being said, the funny thing is that I didn't use this feature nearly as much as I wanted to because the non-customizable boss weapons were so fucking cool. I had an umbrella rapier that expanded and could block hits, a sword with a frankly silly amount of moves and mobility, and a scythe with an extendable whip head. The bottom line is there's just so much variety and fun designs when it comes to offensive options, and I would love to see this weapon assembly system explored further in other games in the future. Speaking of offensive options, there's also the Legion Arm. It's a mechanical arm that functions very similarly to the Shinobi prosthetic from Sekiro, and it lets you mix in a bunch of different moves. You can drag enemies toward you, use your hand like a flamethrower, plant landmines in the ground, use a shield that explodes on impact, or just straight up have a gun with explosive bullets. Here's another neat idea Liza P has. You can break the weapons of enemies if you land enough perfect parries, and what's even crazier is that this applies to bosses too. This lowers the damage and reach of their attacks for the rest of the fight. I think this whole mechanic is super cool, and it's a nice way of rewarding the player for playing with extra precision. This game also does some fun stuff with weapon durability. Basically, your weapon loses durability over time as you attack and block, and you can repair it at any time by using your arm as a grindstone. When you're exploring levels, it honestly barely deserves to exist as a mechanic, but boss fights are where it actually gets interesting. After the first few fights, basically every boss required me to repair my weapon at least once mid-fight, and finding an opening can be difficult. This whole mechanic is justified for the moment of sheer panic that happened when you forget to repair your weapon and then it bounces off the boss mid-fight. On top of that, there's a debuff some enemies inflict called Decay, and in addition to draining your health, it rapidly drains your weapon's durability. So yeah, weapon durability is something that seems pointless early on, but I like how they turned it into a mechanic that you need to pay attention to, adding just that extra bit of challenge to an already difficult game. Weapon durability can almost be entirely ignored in most Souls likes that decide to include it, so it's a nice change of pace to see one where it's a core mechanic. Also, the healing mechanic in Lies of P is kinda neat. Basically, it functions like an Estus Flask, but when you run out of charges, you can recharge an additional use by landing enough hits. This creates scenarios where a comeback is always possible during a boss fight if you play well enough. And yeah, I basically found myself using all of my healing on every boss fight, so it came up more than you might think. So there are more quirks to the combat, but I hope I've painted a picture of how this game has its own identity even if you look at it from a purely mechanical level. It's not just another Souls-like with no new ideas being brought to the table. Take it from someone who's played a lot of these games. I definitely don't always get the impression of a strong identity when playing Souls-likes. Let's move on and talk about level design. For game developers, you can have the best Souls-like combat system in the world, but your game will live or die by its level design. And I've seen so, so many games not pull this part off. I don't think everyone realizes just how much heavy lifting level design does for these games. Even when looking at FromSoft's own games, the level design is absolutely critical for these games being as fun as they are. One of the biggest reasons for this is that regardless of the spin you put on it, Souls-like combat is inherently very simple. You'll be repeating the same attacks and dodges over and over. Therefore, it's necessary that these games have A, a wide variety of different enemy types, and B, a variety of different encounter types. Basically, imagine a game where you keep fighting the same enemies one-on-one -on -one over and over again. This is a recipe for a game that will quickly get monotonous, and if you pay attention, you'll notice that FromSoft is typically very good at avoiding this, and since they were taking extremely thorough notes, the devs of Lies of P avoid this too. I was consistently presented with encounters that put pressure on me. One of the simplest examples of this concept is when an enemy is attacking you with a range attack, but there are one or more enemies between you and them. Do you focus on the closer enemy while avoiding the range attacks, or do you run past them to take out the range enemy? Either way, there's pressure and choice involved, and it makes for an interesting encounter. There's lots of other variations of this concept of mixing up enemies, like maybe you need to fight multiple of this old enemy at once, or maybe you need to fight on a narrow walkway, or maybe there's an ambush after you pick up an item, or maybe there's two dudes with flamethrowers coming at you while bombs are being thrown from further up. Lots of possibilities. And that's just the enemy component of level design. You also have the physical geometry and map layout of level design. And again, yes, there's not much to say beyond this being executed on the level of a FromSoft game. Levels wrap around on themselves, there's shortcuts, verticality, secrets, that type of thing. And that's to say nothing of the beautiful environments and vistas and graphical fidelity on display here. It's top-notch stuff and the end result is that if you told me FromSoft made this game, I'd probably believe you. The only notable deviation is that Lies of P is more linear than any of the FromSoft games. Arguably too linear. There are still side paths, but there's fewer than you'd see from something like Dark Souls or Bloodborne, and there's pretty much always a clear path forward to the boss. To be clear, I think this is fine and works well for Lies of P, but it's the main thing that stands out if you're strictly comparing it one-to-one -one with FromSoft, and I did find myself wishing for moments where I could get lost or stumble across some really big secret or lengthy detour. One of my favorite things in most FromSoft Soft games is how there are so many huge secrets that are optional and easy to miss. With how well the devs of Liza P nailed the environments and the atmosphere, I think this game would have benefited from letting you engage with it more in the form of more exploration. Now, let's take a few minutes to focus on the bosses of this game, and discuss combat more so I can go into more detail. To reiterate, some of the bosses in this game are extremely difficult, and while 
while the difficulty is comparable to Sekiro, some bosses push past that into even more difficult territory. This is the type of game where you'll get beat so bad on your first attempt that it makes you sit up in your chair and think, damn, how am I going to do this? And then you'll die a couple more times, finally get it, and then find out that was just phase one. Get ready for another health bar. I expect this to be the most polarizing aspect of the game, and I've already read quite a few opinions from critics and other people who think this game is too difficult. I think that's a fair opinion to have, especially within the context of difficulty spikes and feeling like levels prior to boss fights don't prepare you enough. But what I like about this game is that it demands you actually learn the whole fight. Like, by the time I had beaten the boss, most of the time I learned how to respond to every single attack, and then it became a dance of executing properly. Very few Souls likes demand this level of performance. Hell, you can fumble your way through plenty of FromSoft boss fights without really needing to learn the whole fight. And that's okay, but I like the challenge lies that Pete presents you with. And for someone like me, who's pretty experienced at these games, but not amazing by any means, it was refreshing to really be pushed. Because despite it all, I know some people are going to disagree, I don't consider this game unfair. Pretty much every time I died, I was like, okay, fair enough. Making a game difficult isn't that hard. There's plenty of bullshit you can introduce. But to make a game difficult in a way that still feels fair with clearly telegraphed attacks and where players will keep trying after a dozen failed attempts, that's a challenge. And I feel like Neo was nailed it here. There are mix-ups and tricky timings with slow and fast versions of certain attacks. Puppet enemies will often confuse you at first with disjointed attack animations. And it feels like every enemy in the game has multiple attacks with huge windups perfectly designed to throw you off. All this is very tough, but never genuine bullshit. Or at least 95% of the time it wasn't bullshit. Could some of the elite enemies and bosses with long attack chains be toned down just a bit? And would the game be better with just one or two extra frames for the parry window? Maybe, yeah, but as it stands, it's still very doable and fun if you're into challenging games. I'll come back to this topic in a bit, but let's keep discussing boss mechanics for now. Despite the difficulty, the developers aren't completely heartless, and they added an optional NPC summon to boss fights to help. In theory, I like this approach to difficulty, and it's similar to what FromSoft does. For some of the fights, I'd say your summon is somewhat helpful as they keep aggro off of you, but for the really tough ones, that summon will almost never survive in the phase 2 of a fight, and that's usually where you need the most help. So regardless of if you choose to use summons or not, you're still mostly on your own, and you will still need to learn the fight. That being said, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a patch that buffs your summon in the coming days or weeks to help people actually beat this game. Boss fights also revolve around staggers, both big and small. Small staggers come in the form of the boss simply stumbling for a moment and letting you get an extra hit in, and the big staggers are the ones I mentioned earlier where you need to land a charge heavy attack once your health bar turns white. While it mostly felt fair for me with my dexterity build, I think the window for big staggers can be punishingly short for strength builds and slower weapons, and there were times where it actually felt impossible to land the hit. And if you don't land that charge heavy attack, you simply miss out on getting that big critical hit. And missing that big critical hit is a bigger deal than you might think, because in addition to not getting that extra damage, you also don't remove the recoverable health from the boss. Because that's another mechanic I hadn't mentioned until now. Bosses slowly regain the faded portion of their health bars over time, kind of similar to how you recover health, and only critical hits from staggers completely remove their recoverable health. This health regen mechanic might sound annoying, but I think it's slow enough that you might not even notice it, and I think its main purpose is to discourage you from playing in a slow and tedious way where you get maybe one hit in at a time and then run away. Instead, you're encouraged to keep up the aggression at all times. I think this is a clever way to subtly push players into that playstyle. Next, a nitpick I have is about how this game still commits to the run back for boss fights. Sekiro and Elden Ring largely ditched this part of the game, and I think it was for the best. I can see the merit of it in some cases, but for Lies of P, it just felt like a holdover from Dark Souls without really adding to the experience. And this is a game where most boss fights are going to take quite a few attempts, so it gets annoying. One critique I want to address is the claim that there are too many two-phase boss fights. And when I say two-phase, I'm specifically talking about how the boss will transform into basically a new fight after you deal enough damage or clear the first health bar. I'm torn on this because I think the fights are very well done, but I'm sympathetic to the idea of boss fatigue. For example, fighting the first phase repeatedly because the second phase keeps kicking your ass can be incredibly frustrating since all you really want to do is just learn the moveset for phase 2, but you slowly need to get there each time by repeating phase 1, which you may have mastered already. So yeah, not sure where I personally land on this topic, just wanted to bring it up and let you know I'm mixed on it, and I see where people are coming from when they complain. Despite that, I really want to stress that Overall, the boss fights are fantastic. These are some of the most challenging and beautifully animated bosses I've seen in the genre as a whole, and some of them manage to bring new ideas to the table too. You got stuff like having a boss that's essentially two bosses stuck together and two different fights depending on which side you approach it from, or doing the classic Ornstein and Smo, but there's three different Ornsteins. While many of these bosses reside within the territory of familiar if you play a few games in the genre, there's still some new stuff here, which I think is pretty commendable. I want to make another side note about the difficulty, and I might repeat myself a bit, but I think it's important I include this since this really is the deal breaker for a lot of people. Yes, this game is very difficult. 
I totally get it. However, I've been reading some takes from people calling for major overhauls to the entire combat system. Like, for example, massively increasing the parry window or letting you animation cancel any attack. I totally get where they're coming from, and I empathize with the frustration that spurred these suggestions, but I think it's the wrong call. Like I said earlier, yeah, maybe a very slight buff to parries would be good, and maybe some minor adjustments to certain attacks could reduce some friction, but nothing completely game-changing. This game was clearly meticulously designed, and choices like attacks not being cancelable or your parry window being relatively small are not mistakes or accidents. They're just different from what a lot of people are used to, and that's why I hesitate on agreeing with calls for major changes to the combat system. Some of these suggestions will have cascading effects that would disrupt the whole balance of the game. The main piece of advice I'd give is don't let your preconceptions about what this game is or your assumptions about what this game wants from you get in the way of your own success. More specifically, while perfect parrying is a central mechanic, it's not the only mechanic, and you don't need to parry every single attack. The way I've seen people talk about this game, it feels like they're treating it like the sequel to Sekiro, and that's a mistake. Guarding and dodging are still extremely useful. Like, when people complain about an enemy doing an attack chain of seven attacks in a row, and saying how it's impossible to parry them all and not rewarding enough, yeah, I get it. But guess what? You never actually needed to parry them all. In fact, on the really quick attacks, it's better to not even attempt parrying. Use dodges, use parries, use fable arts, those are really strong. Fuck it, use consumables, they're actually impactful. Use everything. You still might not succeed, but trust me, keeping an open mind is pretty critical for this game. The overall response reminds me heavily of when Sekiro first came out, and also when the Neo games came out, and how people bounce off of them because they treated them like Souls games. Some people are playing it like it's Bloodborne, some people are playing it like it's Sekiro. Both groups are wrong. You need to play it like it's Lies of P and meet the game where it's at. I understand how everything I'm saying might come across as me just saying skill issue to anyone who disagrees, but that's really not my goal, and I'm open to discussion and even changing my mind. I really just want people to succeed and have fun. That's it. Next, I want to go over a list of major and minor critiques I have that I haven't gone into yet. First, as much as I praised the weapon assembly system earlier, I think there's one very questionable design choice that seriously brings it down. Every weapon blade is capable of two different swing types, slash and stab, but they're usually only proficient at one. This is denoted by an equal sign for the swing type the blade is proficient in, and a down arrow for the swing type it's not proficient in. Side note, this is incredibly easy to miss from a UI perspective. If it was up to me, I would have had a green up arrow and a red down arrow to make this feature unmissable. Anyway, the reason this is questionable is that it seriously limits customization. Suddenly, sticking a hammerhead on a rapier handle gets a damage penalty, and the only reason I can think of why they made this decision is because they wanted the game to be more realistic. But fuck man, making wacky weapons is the best part of this game. Let me poke enemies with a hammer, let me swing my spear like a sword, lean into that. Genuinely, if they simply remove this damage penalty mechanic, there would be twice as many viable customization options with the added bonus of us getting to see more silly shit. Also, I bet a huge portion of the player base never noticed this and were unknowingly lowering their damage by a significant amount. Next, in addition to leveling up, you have access to your P organ, and yes, it's actually called that. It functions as a skill tree and lets you unlock new abilities and passive buffs. I think this is cool in theory, but it's extremely frustrating that core abilities like the ability to chain dodges or do a rolling getup attack are locked behind progression and technically optional. These moves seriously should have just been part of your base moveset for your character, especially when several complaints about the overall feel of the game Game, get addressed once you have them. Like for real, if anything gets patched with this game, just give players these abilities from the start. Lastly, this is less a critique and more an observation, but the bloodstain recovery system is kind of interesting. Haven't seen other people mention this, likely because they didn't notice it, and I myself didn't notice it until halfway through the game. Basically, anytime you're hit on the way back to your bloodstain to recover your souls, you lose a chunk of your total recoverable amount. However, if you kill the enemy that hit you, that amount you lost becomes recoverable once again. I feel like the intention here was to maybe discourage or punish running past enemies as you try to get back to your bloodstain and instead encourage you to take your time. However, I still ran past enemies most of the time anyway with no issues. So yeah, neat idea, but I wonder if it could have been adjusted to make it more of a factor in the gameplay. With the critiques out of the way, I want to go over a bunch of things I liked that I also haven't mentioned until now. I like how your outfit is independent from your defense stats. You do still have equipment and equip load burden to contend with, but the game frames it as internal puppet parts, and as such, it's completely hidden and frees you up to wear whatever outfit you want. I like how heavy and light attacks seamlessly chain into each other. This is something I see a lot of Souls likes ignore. The speed and utility of heavy attacks cause me to actually use them quite a bit, and I found myself using the entire moose of my weapon on a regular basis. I like how you can equip special grindstones to your grinder. This gives you access to weapon buffs once per rest, and because status effects are meaningful in this game, it adds an extra layer of customization and variety regardless of your build. I also like how great the voice acting is in this game. They got some really talented people, like, for example, Anthony Howe voicing Geppetto, who you might know as the voice of Margaret in Elden Ring. Always remember that you're precious to me. 
even when I ask you to do something dangerous. I like the consistently good sound design and visual feedback across the experience. Seeing the sparks fly from a successful parry never gets old, and touches like this go a long way to make actions you'll be repeating countless times continue to feel satisfying. Also, seeing enemies fucking explode when you finish them with a critical hit is fantastic. Lastly, I really like the soundtrack. It's phenomenal, especially the records you can unlock and play in the hub area. Now, I want to take a minute to discuss the overall critical reception of this game, and why it's making me feel like I'm going just a little crazy. I want to preface this by saying I'm not trying to discredit anyone, these are all just video game opinions at the end of the day, and review scores don't do a good job of capturing any level of nuance, but it blows my mind that Lies of P is receiving about the same level of critical success in types of discussions as something like, for example, Mortal Shell, another Souls like. I apologize to Mortal Shell, I'm not trying to single you out, and it was made by a smaller team, so it's a great accomplishment for what it is, but Mortal Shell is what I consider are simply a decent Souls-like. It's fun, has some really cool ideas, but it also has some serious design issues and shoddy execution that make me hesitate in giving it a full recommendation. The truth of the matter is, Lies of P is worlds apart from something like Mortal Shell. I'm not satisfied with calling Lies of P just decent, because I think the developers have achieved something truly special here. This is the real deal, and as one of the largest voices in the community, I feel compelled to make that as clear as I can. It really is on that level that I reserve for actual FromSoft games and stuff like Neo 2. And while I can see some people not agreeing because they think it's too similar to FromSoft, or too difficult, or unfair, or something else, that doesn't change my personal feelings toward the game. It's just a really good game. So yeah, Lies of P is not reinventing the wheel. It's not earth-shatteringly new. It's probably not going to make you feel anything you haven't felt before. It's familiar, but it brings more than enough new ideas to the table in a package with FromSoft levels of polish and execution. It's got a gorgeous world and a compelling story, and it commits so hard to the idea of Bloodborne Pinocchio that you'll forget how silly the premise is as you get sucked into its world. Its crushing difficulty and ways it mixes up the genre will undoubtedly push some people away, but for those who stick it out and are willing to learn, you're going to be in for one of the best games the Souls-like genre has to offer. I know it's probably not on most people's schedules given how packed this year has been with incredible games, but this one is worth your time too. All I can say is I'm incredibly excited to see what these devs do next, and unlike Pinocchio, I'm not lying. Thanks for watching, I really hope I did this game justice, and I'll see you guys in the next one.